One day, while playing with the settings of a car in a simulation game, I noticed a striking fact. Whether I added or removed mass, the braking point of my car remained the same. When it was lighter, my car reached a higher speed, but also braked better. Conversely, when I made it heavier, it accelerated less intensively, but also braked less. Was it a coincidence, or is it a general law? As I thought about it more, I also noticed that before most slow turns, the braking points are the same, and this is true regardless of the car. Including cars as different as Formula One and cheap cars. To explain this phenomenon, I decided to write down the corresponding physical equations. What I found is quite amusing and, in my opinion, not necessarily intuitive. So hold on tight. But before we begin, we must make an important decision to simplify the calculations. In this video, we will neglect wheel road friction as well as aerodynamic friction. As we will see at the end of the video, this assumption has a strong impact on the validity of our conclusions, but rest assured that they remain quite good for many situations. Furthermore, to clarify the discussion, we will consider the case of a stationary car that accelerates as hard as possible before having to brake as hard as possible until it comes to a complete stop. This situation, although particular, allows us to effectively represent a slow portion of the track, typically between two low-speed turns. We will study how the braking point varies depending on parameters such as the car's mass, driving force, and braking force. If a car accelerates on a flat road, it is solely due to the force produced by its engine. What is the connection between acceleration and engine force? Newton's second law simply reflects the fact that the acceleration of an object experiencing a force F is proportional to this force F. However, the larger the mass of the object, the smaller the acceleration. In this animation, the yellow vector represents the acceleration of the car. The car at the bottom of the screen has a mass twice as large, therefore, its acceleration is two times smaller. The same reasoning applies to the braking phase, since braking is nothing more than a negative acceleration. Now, we would like to know the distance L traveled by an object that accelerates. It can be easily proven that this distance is proportional to the acceleration and is expressed as the square of the elapsed time. Let's express this distance L in the case of a car accelerating with an initial velocity of zero. Our goal here is to include the mass in the formula. The acceleration can be obtained using Newton's second law, as seen earlier. Moreover, as mentioned, the initial velocity is zero in this case. This allows us to simplify the formula, which we will use again in a few moments. So we know that in a given time, the more massive of our two cars covers half the distance traveled by the first one. Indeed, no matter the elapsed time, the distance traveled depends on the inverse of the mass. Here, we denote by Fe the force of the engine. Let's perform the same calculation, but for the braking phase that follows the acceleration phase we just discussed. This time, the initial speed is not zero, but is equal to the speed obtained at the end of the previous acceleration. This speed is very simply obtained using the definition of acceleration. As for the value of deceleration, we obtain it thanks to Newton's second law, just as before. Here, Fb represents the force of the brakes. Unfortunately, the formula we retain this time cannot be simplified as much as the previous one, though we will soon get through it.
Now that we know the formulas for acceleration and braking distances, we would like to express their ratio. Indeed, the ratio between acceleration and braking distances allows us to tell things like If the mass of the car is large, then the distance of its braking phase occupies a large percentage of the straight line. So, what is the ratio between braking length and acceleration length? If we do the computations, we find that the mass actually disappears from all terms, proving that the breaking point does not depend on the mass. This is the first important point. The percentage of the straight line where cars accelerate or brake is always the same, provided they have the same engine and brakes. Everything else, like the mass, does not matter. but we can prove something more. For the moment, our formula expresses the fraction of braking distance in terms of the engine and brakes force, but also in terms of the duration of each phase. To get rid of the durations, we have to remember that the effect of the braking phase is to cancel the speed gained during the acceleration. Using again the definition of the acceleration coupled to Newton's second law and rearranging terms, we are left with an expression we can plug in our formula for the ratio of braking to acceleration distances. That's it for math today. We have obtained a very interesting formula. The ratio of braking and acceleration distances is the inverse of that of the engine power and brakes. What we must remember from all this is not only that mass has no impact on the braking point, but also that all cars will brake at the same point as long as the efficiency of their brakes and engines scale the same way with their price. This is why my heavy car brakes at the same point as my light car or even a Formula 1 or a Fiat 500. However, please note that at the beginning of this analysis, we made an assumption, friction forces are negligible. In reality, the faster a car goes, the greater the friction. For this reason, our analysis works better for low speeds. Indeed, when the speed becomes high, the frictional forces are such that there comes a moment when they exactly compensate for the force of the engine. This is what we call the maximum speed of a car. A car capable of quickly reaching its VMAX will typically brake later than a car that reaches it slowly. This is what we observe in braking after long straight lines, such as T1 in Barcelona, where Formula 1 cars brake much later than touring cars. Furthermore, for very obvious reasons, the speed at which the curve is taken skews our conclusions when the car hardly needs to brake to navigate a turn. Some turns simply are not turns at all for certain cars, or appear less tight relative to the car's VMAX. <laughs> Lastly, let's note that the ratio between braking force and acceleration appears to be a marker of an error. Indeed, during this video, I mainly used modern cars, however, it seems that the further back in time we go, the weaker the brakes are compared to the engine power. This is also reflected in the type of circuits where cars raced back then, which had far fewer slow sections.